the wealth gap between white and black people in the United States, a country that always preaches and is supposed to be a defender of equality, fairness, justice, and human rights has always been huge, quite hypocritical in our opinion. Whenever there is a crisis in the United States, for instance, the 2008 housing market crash, blacks in America are hit the hardest. During the housing market crash, more blacks lost their houses by a significant margin compared to White House owners. They were denied loans, and unemployment was significantly higher among blacks than other races in the United States. As Debbie Boshian, senior researcher at the Center for Responsible Lending, once said, billions and billions of dollars were stripped away from a community that already had lower levels of wealth than white communities. And all this happened in a country that promotes itself as the greatest defender of human rights and equality. However, the interesting thing is that this wealth gap between blacks and whites didn't start in 2008. No, it can be traced back to the period after slavery was just abolished in America, when one of the greatest scams to have ever happened to a group of people happened. Not surprisingly, nothing was done about it. This is the story of how the U.S. government stole an equivalent of $1.3 billion in today's dollars from black people with the help of a financial institution called the Freedmen's Bank. It all started after the American Civil War, a war where black slaves fought to ensure their complete freedom. The 13th Amendment, which granted freedom to former slaves, originally promised 40 acres and a mule to newly freed slaves. Unfortunately, it was scrapped from the legislation because it faced violent backlash from Southerners and their Northern supporters. However, supporters of slave freedom understood that the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, was just the first step towards the journey towards full participation in American society for former slaves. To survive the transition to a system based on free labor, the ex-slaves would need food, clothing, shelter, and medical care in the short term. But in the long term, if there was any chance of succeeding in American society, these former slaves would need education, legal services, financial services, and capital. So, on January 27, 1865, a U.S. Congregational minister and slave abolitionist, John W. Alvord, had a meeting with more than 20 philanthropists and leading members of the business community. The purpose of the meeting was to explore the idea of establishing a savings bank for the benefit of the ex-slaves who had become soldiers in the American army during the Civil War. John Alvord, who had worked with black soldiers in a variety of humanitarian ventures, told the group that many black soldiers who were receiving payments for enlisting in the service had no safe place to deposit their money. Others, with no experience in managing their finances, were either squandering their pay or being victimized by swindlers. To help the situation, Alvord proposed a plan to establish a benevolent banking institution that would provide African-American soldiers with a secure place to save their money and at the same time encourage thrift and industry in the wider African-American community. Alvord's plan, however, was not the first attempt to assist black soldiers in saving. Prior to this time, a few states in the North had created an allocation system that allowed both black and white soldiers to have some parts of their pay deducted each month, which were sent to relatives or held by military officials until the soldiers left the service. Several other military commanders also made attempts to help black soldiers as well as civilians save for the future. One such military commander was General Rufus Saxton, who in 1864 created the Military Savings Bank at Beaufort, South Carolina, eventually known as the South Carolina Freedmen's Savings Bank, to secure the deposits of African-American soldiers and civilians. In the same year, General Benjamin Butler established a similar bank in Norfolk, Virginia, while General Nathaniel Banks established the Free Labor Bank, which maintained deposits from thousands of black soldiers and former slaves who still worked on plantations under the control of the federal government. However, John Alvord saw these early efforts as temporary measures. In his opinion, what the blacks needed to successfully transition from slavery to freedom and be fully incorporated into American society was a permanent savings bank. After several reviews of Alvord's plan, the group eventually voted and concluded that a charter should be secured from the federal government. With the assistance of Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, a bill to establish the Freedmen Savings and Trust Company was brought before Congress on the 13th of February, 1985. And, after some brief confusion on the location of the bank, 
an act to incorporate the Freedmen Savings and Trust Company, was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln on March 3, 1865. This was the final bill Linvon signed before his death on April 15th of the same year. So finally, black people had their own bank with a clear objective and purpose, which was a simple savings institution created primarily for former slaves and their descendants. According to the charter, deposits made by blacks, except for a fund set aside for operating costs and other emergencies, would be invested in stocks, bonds, treasury notes, or other securities of the United States. It also noted that no loans would be made and that all the assets of the bank were owned by the depositors in proportion to the deposits of each. To give the bank some credit, the founders of the bank had a noble idea, which was to give black people a chance at a stable life. Blacks could now open bank accounts with as little as five cents and earn interest on deposits of one dollar. Originally, the act that created the bank made no provisions for branch offices outside the District of Columbia. However, Alvord, together with other members of the group, planned to open branches of the bank in places where blacks were highly populated, especially in the South. By January 1866, Alvord and other bank officers had moved with missionary-like zeal to open branches in Richmond, Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, Vicksburg, and Houston. Between 1865 and 1871, the Freedmen's Bank opened some 37 branch offices in 17 states and the District of Columbia. In less than a decade, an estimated 70,000 depositors had opened and closed accounts, with bank deposits totaling more than $57 million. In 1870, a newspaper called The New National Era said the Freedmen's Bank was doing a fantastic job of teaching black people essential habits that they believed were necessary for their success in American society. The Freedmen's Bank was unique and different from other banks in some ways. First, the bank worked mainly in the South and in places where banks never existed. Secondly, it was created specifically for former slaves and had so many branches. Lastly, the bank was one of the only banks Congress officially approved and supposedly kept an eye on. This gave blacks confidence that their money was secure and encouraged more blacks to open accounts and keep their money with the bank. As earlier stated, in less than a decade, over 70,000 blacks had deposited their money in the Freedmen's Bank. The reason for this huge number can be attributed to the advertising strategy of the bank during its early years. Aside from using pamphlets, cards, and circulars, the bank invested heavily in newspaper advertising. At the time, newspapers were incredibly popular, common, and cheap, meaning blacks could easily get their hands on them. One of the newspapers that usually featured advertisements for the bank was The New National Era, a major national newspaper that focused on the problems faced by the black community. The bank also created its own newspaper called The National Savings Bank, which lasted between 1868 and 1872. 15,000 copies of the National Savings Bank were printed every month and distributed in all sorts of places, including schools, churches, and different societies. The huge number of depositors and the total amount of money deposited in less than a decade made Freedmen's Bank one of the largest savings banks in the country. Black people believed that the government had their back, and with all confidence, they continued to save their money and encourage their family members to save as well. However, it was all a scam. When Alvord's plan was brought before Congress on February 13, 1865, what they agreed to enact was a legislature to establish the first of its kind social services agency known as the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was created to administer a broad program of help and self-help. In line with its goal of administering help to black people, the Bureau created the Freedmen's Bank. The Bureau helped to advertise the bank, which attracted tens of thousands of black depositors. However, when the bank was advertised to the public, it failed to mention that the Bureau was different from the bank. While the Freedmen's Bureau was a government organization, the Freedmen's Bank was a private institution, not backed by the government. So Congress gave the bank the green light, but they refused to guarantee the safety of depositors' money. The bank officials and advertisers failed to mention this crucial information to black people, and they went on to believe their money was in safe hands. 
However, a few years after what looked like a resounding success, the bank began to experience problems as a result of mismanagement and outright fraud. Recall that in a short period of time, the bank established so many branches which attracted new deposits but also depleted its resources. It built a splendid headquarters in Washington, D.C., which cost more than $200,000 to construct and furnish. This needless exorbitant expenditure was part of the problem that caused the bank's eventual collapse. In addition to that, many of the people who were hired were unqualified and the rest were corrupt. The bank was becoming increasingly difficult to manage and the inspections that were supposed to be carried out by Congress were rare. Interest paid on deposits was high and the central administration of the bank struggled to control the other branches. With this kind of bad management, embezzlement and fraud was the order of the day. Some officials of the bank started stealing depositors' money to invest in risky real estate and railroad bonds, while others gave the money as loans to their friends and family. At the same time, the officials pushed Congress to pass a bill that would allow real estate loans to be granted. Meanwhile, under the National Bank Law, carried out by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, real estate lending was explicitly forbidden. Congress went along with it, and real estate loans were given out. However, this action together with mismanagement, fraud, and embezzlement pushed the bank to a critical condition. By 1873, as the national economy spiraled downward, the bank's condition also worsened. It was at this time Congress asked the OCC to examine the bank, but it was too late because no one had been watching over the bank's affairs. Its officers had fallen victim to their own inexperience and to the machinations of the likes of Henry Cook, who served on the bank's board while also serving his family banking business, using the assets of the former to benefit the latter. In an attempt to steady the bank in the eyes of its depositors so that they would not withdraw their savings, bank officials elected Frederick Douglass, an African-American businessman, as president. Frederick, however, was not aware of the true state of the bank and went ahead to invest $10,000 of his own money to demonstrate his faith in its future. However, after a few months as president of the bank, Frederick realized that he was married to a corpse and recommended to Congress that the bank be closed. And by an act of June 20, 1874, the Freedmen's Bank was shut down on June 29, 1874. The closure of the bank was devastating for the African-American community and shattered the dreams of Douglas and others with high hopes for its future. But it was more than that. It also left 61,144 depositors with losses of nearly $3 million, which is more than $1 billion in today's equivalent. All this happened because depositors were led to believe that the bank's assets were not protected by the federal government. Unfortunately, only half of the depositors received three-fifths of the value of their accounts, while others received nothing. Some depositors and their descendants spent more than 30 years petitioning Congress for reimbursement for losses. But nothing was granted, and the issue died down. According to Frederick Douglass, the collapse of the Freedmen's Bank was equivalent to adding another 10 years of slavery to the Negro man. This scam, because that is what it is, created the huge wealth gap between the whites and the blacks in the United States. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video.